Good morning. If you would uh, open your Bibles and turn with me to Genesis 25. Genesis 25. We'll begin reading in verse 20. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah to wife, the daughter of Bethuel of the Syrian of Padanaram, the sister to Laban the Syrian. And Isaac entreated the Lord for his wife because she is barren, and the Lord was entreated of him. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. And the children struggled together within her. And she said, If it be so, why am I thus? And she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said unto her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manner of people shall be separated from thy bowels. And the one people shall be stronger than the other people, and the elder shall serve the younger. This is a a promise that the Lord gives us, and he speaks it so it will come to pass. And he illustrates that for us just shortly after, if you skip down to verse 29. And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I'm faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I'm at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day, and he swore unto him. And he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink, and rose up, and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our merciful Holy Father, we thank you that life is of you and that you are life. Lord, we see our two natures as believers and we despise our old nature, Lord. We ask that you would cause that old nature to bow and be subservient to the new nature which is given by you, Lord. We ask that you would make yourself known today. We ask that you would forgive our sins and our iniquities as you promised to do for your elect. Lord, we thank you for this time that you've given us and we ask that you'd be with your men preaching your word, including Hugo and Lakeland. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand together again. We'll sing the hymn that's on the back of your bulletin. Oh, 
like steel and left me void of breath. Tis for your sins this pain I feel, for you I go to death. Your soul before my Father's throne could find no place to this is the way God can be just and you be justified. Jehovah's mercies never fail, each morning they are due. Great is his faithfulness and love there. We're not consumed. Jehovah God in Christ the Son shall all my portion be. My soul shall therefore wait for him and live eternally. Please be seated. Rebecca Vincent is in town. She's going to bring special music for us now.
to Rebecca. That was his blessing. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel, book of Daniel, chapter chapter 4. <clears throat> that... Um, A song you sang, Dan, uh, Rebecca, could not have been more appropriate to what I want to try to preach this morning. I titled this message, The Power of God. And the power of God is for the powerless and only for the powerless. The last thing the Lord Jesus did before ascending into glory was he told the disciples, all power, all power has been given unto me. Therefore, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. The power of God's for the powerless. There's a story in 1 Samuel when David was first fleeing from Saul where the scripture says that he was in the cave of Adullam, and the word Adullam means justice. And it's a picture of Christ, the son of David, on the cross, satisfying the demands of God's justice on behalf of his people. And the Bible says, all they that were in distress, all they that were in debt, and all they that were discontented came to David, and he became captain over them. Those are the qualifications for salvation, being in distress, being in debt, being discontented, being powerless when we were yet without strength, without any strength. In due time, Christ died for the ungodly. The Lord told the prophet Isaiah, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Uh, the gospel is for those who need comfort, those who are distressed and powerless without it. Speak ye comfortably unto Jerusalem. I, I so hope that the Lord will be pleased to speak comfort to our hearts this morning about his power. This message is about the power of God, the power of God. And in the language of the Bible, the word able, which we're going to look at several verses this morning where it talks about God is able. The word able is the word power. It comes from the same word. And the reason why God is able is because he has the power to, to do it. <clears throat> Paul tells us, God tells us in 1 Corinthians that God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. That he has chosen the things that are naught. They have nothing. They can do nothing. They know nothing. <laughs> They're completely dependent upon him. That all glory might be on Christ. Oh, there we are. This is a faithful saying, and this is worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. What am I trying to say? Here are the qualifications for having the power of God on you. Paul said, when I am weak, then I am strong, for his strength is made perfect in my weakness. We will not know anything of the power of God until God strips us of all of our power. And so to be in distress and to be in debt and to be discontented and to be in need of comfort and to be without power and without strength is the qualification for salvation. And it is the one that the Lord meets for us in making us dependent upon him. The gospel is for the downcast. It is for the weak, it is for the despised, it is for the poor, it is for the broken, it is for the naked, it is for the sinful. 
and it's only for them. I know I said this recently, I don't remember if it's Wednesday or last Sunday, but I've heard people say, God helps those who help themselves. That's not true. God helps those who can't help themselves. And so my question to you and to myself is, are we at the place where we have no ability to help ourselves? God has emptied us. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What is it to be poor in spirit? It's to have nothing. It's to be in abject poverty. You see, the, the glory of Christ, here's the, here's the truth. We, we, cannot, we cannot estimate ourselves low enough. We cannot estimate Christ high enough. And we cannot estimate grace free enough. And the freeness of grace has to do with our need and his provision. Power of God. When the Lord spoke of a rich man entering into the kingdom of heaven, he wasn't just talking about material wealth, although that oftentimes keeps someone from needing God. They have their problem solved with money. But it's not always the case. God can take a rich man, and often does, and uh, makes him in need of Christ. And that's what this passage goes on to say, because the Lord said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. He's not just talking about material wealth. He's talking about the riches of one's self-righteousness, which we all fall into. And... Uh, and the, Lord, and the disciples said, who, Lord, then can be saved? <laughs> who can be saved? It, it, we're, how are you going to get a camel through the eye of a needle? That's not possible. And what did the Lord say? With man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. I have the power to put a man or put a camel through the eye of a needle. And I have the power to take a man who is rich in himself and make him poor and dependent upon me the power of God what God does what God's able to do what God has the power to do that we don't have the power to do and we completely depend upon his power for it now before we look at these verses uh, I want to say that there are some things that God cannot do God cannot lie God cannot sin <laughs> uh God cannot change. I am the Lord and I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. God made a, a covenant promise in eternity past before time ever was. And the only hope of our salvation, if God waited until he looked at us and saw us, he'd change his mind, wouldn't he? But he can't change. <laughs> He can't change. I am the Lord and I change not. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's our hope that we sons of Jacob, the supplanter, the sinful one, and that's our old man, Adam, that you just read about, Jacob and Esau, they live together in the same womb. Why am I thus? Because there's two nations in you. But the older, the firstborn, the man of the flesh, Esau, shall serve the younger, Jacob, the newborn. And the new man born in Christ always is subduing that old man. Every time that old man's always there, he doesn't get any better, but he is, he is restrained. He is restrained. He is subdued by, the, by the, the new nature, the new man. May God make it so that we're... God, God cannot lie, cannot change. God cannot accept a sinner apart from faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, for we cannot come to him. <laughs> no man can come before him without faith. 
God cannot punish the same sin twice. He can't do it. If the sacrifice that Christ made was sufficient, if he sacrificed himself for the sins of all men on Calvary's cross, then God cannot take any son of Adam and send him to hell because that would be punishing sin twice, and that's unjust. He can't do that. No, the Lord Jesus died for all the sins of all of his people once and for all and put them away and God can't punish those sins again. He said, I've separated them from you as far as the east is from the west and I, I, I remember them no more. Remember them no more. How can God remember something that's gone? It's gone. It's put away. It's been paid for. Justified in the sight of God means that we're without sin. It doesn't mean that God sees us as if we didn't have any sin. He sees us in Christ, without sin, perfect, in the person of our substitute. And God cannot punish the same sin twice. He can't do it. God cannot deny himself. (laughs) When we believe not, the scripture says, and how often that happens, Oh, there's a part of us that's always unbelieving. When we, that's, the, that's the root cause of all of our sin. That's, the old, that's that old man. He's an unbeliever. But when we believe not, <laughs> he remaineth faithful, for he cannot deny himself. God can't deny himself. How, does he, how, how can he say that about me? Deny himself? Well, the same thing that the Lord Jesus said to to Saul of Tarsus when he arrested him on the road to Damascus. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. You see, the persecution that Saul was inflicting on the church, God considered to be against him. And so it is in our righteousness, perfect in Christ. And he cannot deny himself. So there's things God cannot do. And that's that's glorious. That's that's our hope, that he can't do those things. You have your Bibles open to Daniel chapter 4. The one thing that you and I cannot do, that only God has the power to do, is humble our pride before him. Now, The natural man might get humbled by his circumstances. Um, But to be made a sinner, that's that's the real heart. I I love the definition of sin. We think about it, the word pride, the middle letter of the word pride is is the letter I, isn't it? And the middle letter in the word sin is the letter I. And that's really the essence of our problem. We got an eye problem. It's all about me. And uh, and left ourselves, we will believe ourselves to be able to present something before God that would be that would be satisfactory. And, And God has to humble that pride, and only He can do it. Only God can make of a self-righteous a sinner. And here's what he said. This way he did for Nicodemus, I mean for Nebuchadnezzar. Look at verse uh, verse 37, the last verse of Daniel chapter 4. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven. He gets all the glory He has all the righteousness. He has all the power. All whose works are truth and his ways judgment. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth has met together. In wisdom at Calvary's cross, his ways are judgment. Here's the the cave of Adullam where the Lord Jesus meets with all that are distressed and all that are in debt and all that are 
discontented. All the sinners come to him and he becomes their captain. All his ways and all of his works are truth and all of his ways are judgment. And those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. And only he can do it. You find a sinner, a person who believes that they have no righteousness left to themselves, that all of their righteousness are filthy rags before God. A person who is looking in faith to Christ alone for all their righteousness before God and giving to him all the glory for all his accomplishments and for all their salvation. You found a miracle. You found a miracle of grace. Because only God can do that. Only God can turn stones into the children of Abraham. <laughs> now what he said to the Pharisees, the Pharisees said, we're children of Abraham. God said, if you were children of Abraham, you'd believe on me. God is able to take those, and he pointed to some stones. God is able to take those stones and turn them into the children of Abraham. And brethren, that is exactly what he does when he abases our pride. When he humbles us in his presence, he takes out the heart of stone and puts in a heart of flesh. And he causes us to confess what Nebuchadnezzar confessed. He gets all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. And he has the power to take those who, by nature, we all do it. Oh, we have so much pride. And the more we grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ, the more of that pride we see. The more of that old self-righteousness and pride and, and, and selfishness and all those things that are of the flesh, all those dark recesses of our hearts, the brighter the light gets, the more of those things come to light. And the more we see our need for the Lord to abase those who walk in pride. In pride. And he has the power to do it. He's the only one that can take a Saul of Tarsus, knock him off his high horse, and cause him to say, Lord, what would you have me to do? And outwardly, Moral, self-righteous man like Saul of Tarsus. <laughs> He's the only one that can take a, a Moses, a proud Moses, who tried to deliver. That's what Moses killing the, the, the Egyptian soldier was all about. Moses knew that he was a descendant of Abraham, and Moses thought, I'm going to deliver these people. And he tried to do it in his own strength, in his own pride. And God had to send him on the backside of the desert for 40 years to tend sheep. What was the Lord doing? Humbling the pride. Abasing those who walk in pride. You know, God humbled him. <laughs> Lord, who am I? What, 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 when the Lord did reveal him to him, to, to him at the, the burning bush, what did Moses say? Lord, I can't speak. <laughs> who am I? I... I how can I stand before Pharaoh? Well, Moses, that's why you've been back here for 40 years. I... And Moses never got a degree from the, from the school of, of humility. And he, he, he still had to learn that lesson for another 40 years, leading the children of Israel through the wilderness. But God is able to abase those who walk in pride. You and I are proud people. Sinfully proud. And only God can humble that pride. We don't have the, you know, we think that we're humbling ourselves <laughs> and we're humbling our self righteous humility is worse than self righteous pride, isn't it? Pride, pride, it just, it's so fake. When God does it, He knows how to do it. And He does it in different ways, at different times, and different ones of His children. He knows exactly what we need. And no chastisement is joyous for the season, the scripture says. The hand of God can be heavy and difficult. 
as he abases us as we walk in our pride. But in the end of the day, it leads to the peaceable fruit of righteousness because it causes us to look to Christ for all of our righteousness. God's the only one that has the ability to do that. You and I can't do it. But oh, how merciful and how gracious and how kind and how good he is. And he measures it not too heavily. You know, that passage I just quoted in Romans chapter 12, he's talking about parents disciplining their children and we all disciplined our children and oftentimes our hand was too heavy and oftentimes it was too light. God's hand is never that way. It's measured perfectly. Child of God, your heavenly father's hand is exactly what it needs to be in each situation, each circumstance. What is he doing? He is humbling the pride of his children. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. This is the power of God. This is what you and I don't have the power to do. You can't make yourself a sinner. You can't make yourself not look. You see, all of the righteous in Christ believe themselves to be unrighteous. They believe yourself to be everything about you to be unrighteous. And all the unrighteous, <laughs> all those who have never known the grace of God in salvation, being made a sinner, believe themselves to be righteous. And if at the moment you, they can't find something righteous about themselves, they believe themselves to have the potential for righteousness. Surely, Lord, I can do something. I've got, you know, I, I, I've got a good heart. I, I, can, I can produce something that will be pleasing in your sight. If God has done for you what you cannot do for yourself, if he's abased you in your pride as only he knows how to do, you know that you have no righteousness outside of Christ and that you have no potential for righteousness outside of Christ. That the Lord Jesus is all of your righteousness before God. That's a miracle of grace. You can't do that. Only God can do that. Look at the second time. Second verse I want us to consider. And there's several here. But we're just going to look at a few. Hebrews chapter 7. Look with me at verse, at verse 25. Wherefore. He is able. You remember that word's power. He is able also to save them to the uttermost. Now that word uttermost means all the way to the end. That's what the word uttermost means. All the way to the end. Fully, completely. He's not going to lose one. <laughs> That come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So we have an advocate. We have an intercessor seated at the right hand of God. And he's going to save to the uttermost, all the way to glory. He's going to finish what he started. And he's the only one that can do it. Because left ourselves... We would quit along the way. And if you don't believe that about yourself, if you, it, it, what was Peter doing? Peter was walking in pride when he said, Lord, they may fall away, but not me. Oh, Peter. Satan has asked to sift you, and I've agreed to let him do it. Because you need humbling. <laughs> but be of good cheer. I've prayed for you. There's the difference. I've prayed for you. It's going to produce the peaceable fruit of righteousness for you, Peter. <clears throat> he is able to save all the way to the end. The Lord Jesus was faithful all the way to the end. He bowed 
his mighty head on Calvary's cross and he declared, it is finished. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. He did everything. Father, he said, I have loved them to the end. <laughs> to the uttermost. He is able. Revelation chapter 5. John is caught up into a vision in heaven and he, and he sees the book sealed with seven seals. And no man and no angel was found that could open the book. And John wept. This is the book of life. If this book is not open, no one will be saved. And the angel said, John, weep not. Stop your crying. The lion of the tribe of Judah, he hath prevailed, and he is able to unlock the seals and to open the book. Oh, brethren, we have a Savior that has gone all the way to the uttermost, and just as he was faithful to go all the way to the uttermost, all the way to the end, so he is faithful to keep his people all the way to the end. From the demon-possessed man of the Gadarenes to the outward, outwardly moral, self-righteous Pharisee, he's able to save to the uttermost. From the woman at the well who had ruined her life in five marriages and was living with a man that wasn't her husband, to Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus, he is able to save to the uttermost. Male, female, rich, poor, bond, free, Greek, Jew, <laughs> doesn't matter. He's faithful. He has the power to save his people to the uttermost. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. If you're familiar with this passage, we quote it quite often. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Verse 12. For the which cause... I also suffer these things. Paul's talking about his imprisonment and he's encouraging the believers not to be offended by the imprisonment that he's suffering as a result of preaching the gospel. He says, for which cause I also suffer these things because of the gospel. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. I don't want you to be ashamed and I'm not ashamed. I'm in prison, I'm chained, I'm bound, but the word of God is not bound. Don't be ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am fully persuaded that he is able. He has the power. He is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Now, we use that word commitment as a, as a, as a word to describe, you know, being, being fully invested in something. And that's really what the word here means. It means to, to have all your eggs in one basket. He's, he's not talking about his, you know, Paul had lapses in his commitment just as you and I have lapses in our commitments. But he had committed the salvation of his soul. He had entrusted, he had invested all his assets in the in one bank you know it'd be if a man had a lot of wealth in this world it'd be foolish for him to invest it all in one place we diversify our assets don't we so that if one goes one falls short another one may make up for it at the end of the day we get a we get a positive benefit to our investments and most people in religion do that well I'll put a little bit here a little bit there you know, I look back to a prayer that I prayed. I look back to my baptism. I look back to, you know, some good thing that I've done or some feeling that I experienced. Or That's a big one. I, I talk to people all the time. Well, you know, 
and they talk about going to some false church and Pentecostal experience and they got warm all over it and they just tingled and, and they knew that God had saved them because of that experience. And they were holding on to that. And I tell you about when they got saved. Now I'm going to invest a little bit there, a little bit over here. At the end of the day, maybe one of these investments will pay off and I'll, I'll be able to go to heaven. That's exactly what Paul's saying he didn't do. I put all my hope in one. And if he doesn't save me, I won't be saved. It's all or nothing. I'm going to either gain everything or I'm going to lose everything. And it's all going to be based on him. And that's what this word commitment means. I know whom I have believed and I'm persuaded that he has the power to keep that which I've invested in him. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with much joy. He's able. And if he doesn't keep us, we won't be kept. Child of God, you know that about yourself. The unbeliever might think, well, I, you know, I'll, be, I'll be able to persevere. The perseverance of the saint is only because of the preservation of the spirit. And if the spirit of God doesn't preserve us and keep us and bring us back again and again and again and renew our faith daily and give us the bread of life in Christ daily, we'll... We'll go somewhere else. We'll fall away. We'll forget about it. We'll leave. We'll depart. You've seen enough of your own flesh to know that that's what you would do but for the grace of God. He has the power. <laughs> oh, Peter went back to fishing. He thought, I've, I've blown it. I'm, no way I can be saved. And when the Lord met Mary at the tomb on that resurrection morning, what did he say? Go tell Peter and the disciples that I've risen. Peter needs to hear it first. I'm going to keep that man. And when the Lord met him on the shore, mending his nets, he'd already gone back to fishing. He'd figured there was no chance for him the Lord restored him. Why? Because of the preservation of the Spirit of God, the perseverance of the saint. God's going to pursue his, pursue his people and he's going to save them all the way to the end, to the uttermost. And he's going to do it, <laughs> humbling us, sending Nathans to us. Oh, David, Nathan said the prophet. Thou art the man. And what David say? Oh, I've sinned. And Nathan said, yes, you have. And God has forgiven you. <laughs> he forgave you before you confessed it. You see, here's the, here's the covenant of, that, of works that most men think about it is true. If I confess my sins, he will, he will forgive me. My forgiveness is dependent upon my confession. When the truth is the opposite, I have forgiven you. And you will confess. You will confess. <laughs> you will be brought to confession of your sins because of the forgiveness that I've accomplished. I've already put that sin away. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not be want, in want of anything. His rod, a correcting rod, and his staff. The difference between the rod and the staff. Well, the rod was used for correction. The staff was a symbol of authority. And David said this in Psalm 23, his rod and his staff, they comfort me. I'm comforted to know that he has the power and the authority to keep me 
and that he will do all that's required in order to present me faultless before his throne. He's able. I don't have that power. I don't have the power to humble myself. I don't have the power to come to Christ. I don't have the power to keep coming. I don't have the power to stay. He has that power. His strength will be made perfect in my temptations, in my weakness. Turn with me to uh, Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. He has the power and the ability to help us in our temptations. Look at verse 17. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself hath suffered, being tempted, he is able. The Lord revealed this to me recently. I mentioned it once in a message a week or a few weeks ago. I've always thought of, you know, well, the Lord, the Lord knows the full weight of sin and the full power of sin in ways that we can't know it. But he knows each individual sin. And so, child of God, when you're, when you're wallowing in the shame and guilt of a particular sin... And you're afraid to come before the throne of grace? The Lord knows that sin. And he knows that sin to its fullest degree. He knows the shame and the guilt and the fear of that sin in a way that you can't know it. So come. (laughs) Come. Turn over uh, chapter 4. Of Hebrews. Chapter 4 of Hebrews. Look at verse 15. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points, in all points, in each individual particular sin. Tempted like as we are, yet without sin he wasn't guilty of the commission though he bore the shame and the guilt and the penalty and the and the punishment for that sin in a way that we can't imagine let us therefore let us let us not hide from God Let us not do what Adam did in the garden when he was feeling the shame of his sin and he tried to cover his nakedness with fig leaves and tried to hide among the trees. Let us not do that. Let us come boldly before the throne of grace to find help in our time of need. He knows. He knows every point of every sin. And he has the power. He put it away. And he has the power to help us in our time of need. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, seeketh whom he may devour. Who are the two men in the Old Testament that slew a lion with their bare hands? David. He snatched the sheep right out of the jaws of that lion and killed that lion with his hands. And that's the Lord Jesus. When we get in the jaws of evil, we've got a Savior who is able to save to the uttermost and will snatch us from the very jaws of the lion who's seeking whom he may devour. He won't devour. He'll seek to devour, but he won't be able to devour. And then, who's the other one? The strong man. His name? Samson. Samson. 
killed a lion with his bare hands and went back to that lion and what was in the lion? Honey. And what's that honey a picture of? It's a picture of the word of God. It's the gospel. It's Christ. The, thy word was sweet to my taste like honey. And honey gives light to the eyes and energy and hope and And so out of the lion came honey. And our strong man, the Lord Jesus, who took the gates of of hell and carried them off and came in and led captivity captive, has taken the very temptations of sin. That's Esau. And uh, caused them to turn Jacob, the new man, to Christ. For in that same passage in 1 Peter chapter 5, where he says that that Satan is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, he says, he goes on to say, resist him in the faith. How do we resist him? We look to Christ, who who alone has the power and the ability to take us out of of the jaws of the lion. Otherwise, that lion will devour us if he doesn't come do it. And he alone can bring sweetness out of sin. Because the rest of that verse says that, well, let's turn to it. Let's turn to it. First Peter chapter 5. Verse 9. Whom resist steadfast in the faith. Don't miss that. We don't grit our teeth and pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and say, I'm going to fight the devil. You try that, you're going to lose every time. His strength is made perfect in my weakness. Lord, I I don't have the ability to resist these things. Lord, you're going to have to, you're going to have to deliver me. That's what it means to resist in the faith. Knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Every child of God has their Samson slaying the lion and bringing out of the the carcass of the lion honey. That's the accomplishment. Only God can do that. Only God can take the evil of our sin and the temptations of the devil and bring faith and hope and love and truth in Christ. Make his word come alive. That's the honey that he brings. Second Corinthians chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Look with me at verse, at verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. Where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. If it wasn't for the power of God and the ability of our God, our Savior who's called the Almighty. He's the omnipotent one. He's the one who has all power. We have no power. If it wasn't for his power, we would be kept. (laughs) But he is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound unto every good work. Only he can take selfish, self-righteous, worldly people and cause them to value his kingdom and his work to pray for the furtherance of the gospel to give their their lives and their means to the furtherance of the gospel only he can do that and he's able that's why Romans chapter 12 I beseech you therefore brethren out of, in light of the first 11 chapters of Romans is a clear declaration, the clearest declaration of what God has done in Christ to save his people. I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God 
that you present yourself a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It's only reasonable. <laughs> only he can do that. I'm sorry, I have to deal with these two more verses. Look at me at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Only God can translate and change these vile bodies in which we live into a glorified body, a sinless body, make us perfect. Take that which is mortal and make it immortal. Take that which is corruptible and make it incorruptible. Only God can do that. Look at Philippians chapter 3. At verse 21, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto a glorious body according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. Oh, what a powerful God. Child of God, we have this hope that when we close our eyes in death and we draw our last breath, that God's going to send his angels. And somewhere between that moment and the moment in which we open our eyes, we're going to be given a new body, a resurrected body, a sinless body. Why? Because he is able to subdue all things unto himself. One more verse, Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. I want to close with this. Look with me at verse 20. Now unto him that is able, that has the power to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. God doesn't use excessive speech. He doesn't use superfluous words. He doesn't exaggerate. So when he says, he's making emphasis here. When God says that he is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ever should even imagine to ask for. <laughs> what is the Lord saying to me and you? You know just a little bit of my power, but oh, how much greater it is than you've even begun to imagine. How underestimated we have been of his glory. How overestimated we have been of our strength. Child of God, let us. Let us lower the estimation of ourselves. And might I say, let us lower the expectations of others. Sometimes we expect more from others than we do from ourselves, don't we? How self-righteous is that? But let us raise by God's grace our expectation and our estimation of his exceedingly abundantly power to do more than we can even imagine. That's our God. We can't. He can. Amen? All right. Let's stand together. Tom, you come. Number 19, the Sproul Hymnal. Number 19. Sovereign ruler, Lord of all, prostrate hand.
are holy, wise, and just. I'm a creature of the dust. All things move at your command, governed by your mighty hand. Heaven, earth, and hell I see, fulfill all your wise decree. There's a man resist his Lord, stand against the sovereign God. I will bow before your throne, seeking grace in Christ your Son. Through his blood and righteousness, Lord, I plead with you for grace. If you will, you can, I know, grace and mercy to me show. Will you, Lord, my soul forgive? Grant the sinner grace to live. I've no other hope but this, Jesus' blood and righteousness. Now I'm conquered by your grace. In the dust I hide my face. Give me Christ, Lord. Else I die, I upon your grace rely. Oh, for mercy, now I plead. Grant me, Lord, the grace I need. Turn, oh, turn to me and say, All your sins are washed away. In my Son, your debt is paid. He for you the ransom made.